it is on. Okay. Is this on? You hear me? Okay, good. Sorry, the, the light doesn't go on and I'm technically challenged. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion uh, with um, a group of very, uh, very um, strong panelists. Uh, at the far end is, is uh, Alexandra Borchardt, who's the former manag managing editor of the Deutsche Zeitung and the director of leadership programs at the Reuters Institute uh, at Oxford. Um, directly to my right is uh, Daoud Koutab, who uh, had been a professor of journalism at Princeton. He is based in Amman, uh, where he works on media projects and is uh, on the press freedom committee of the International Press Institute. Uh, Courtney Raj is Advocacy Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists, and Anya Schifrin is Director of the Technology, Media, and Communications uh, Specialization at the School of International and Public Affairs, SIPA, at Columbia University in New York. Um, and I'm very happy uh, to uh, have a chance to moderate this, this panel. Um, and I'd like to, by way of introduction, uh, challenge the, the premise of the description of the panel, which is, you know, media covering media. And, uh, and the, it was a striking description to me because, uh, you know, if you, if you turn on, um, uh, you know, any, uh, you know, network news uh, channel or news program, very often you see reporters sitting around in a semicircle talking about what reporters do and talking about the news. Um, uh, it's a profession that gives out probably more awards than any other profession I've, 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 uh, 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 you know, I've, I've come across. In other words, it seems like it's already a very self-referential profession. Report, reporters gather at festivals like this every year and talk about what reporters do, right? So what then uh, are, are, needs to be done? Is what kind of coverage uh, is necessary to, uh, to confront and reverse as much as possible this trend toward suspicion of, 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 journalism, uh, of journalism and journalists um, and uh, the kind of devaluation of uh, of, of independent reporting, of investigative reporting. Part of this is obviously uh, disrupted business models with Facebook and Google taking all of the digital advertising revenue so nobody can figure out how to make money. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the, 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 the base of the problem, the, the fundamental uh, issue that, that, um, that uh, occasions this panel, which is the threat, the various threats not only in terms of physical violence uh, and, and, and repression, but more broadly, delegitimization of the, of the, uh, of, of the media. So um, uh, I will throw it open to, uh, to the, uh, the panelists to, I hope, at some point in your presentations, address this, uh, this question. So why don't we start with, uh, do you want to start, Alexandra, or you don't want to start? You do want to start, okay? <laughs> and we'll just and we'll just go down the line. I do have slides. And who's going to bring them on? Thank you, thank you. Okay. Well, it's, uh, thank you for for coming here and making it through the rain. First question is, who of you all is a media editor or has written about the media, has covered the media industry? Okay, quite a few. Okay, um, this will be about reporting about the media and why news literacy matters. And well, yeah, this is where I work, the Reuters Institute in Oxford. Uh, we do comparative journalism research. We have a journalist fellowship program and we run leadership programs. So if you ever wanna learn more about journalism, come join us there. Anyway, um, yes, you all, you media editors, you know uh, the first point I wanna make, reporting 
about the media is a challenge. All of you know that because, yeah, your colleagues, everyone knows another editor-in-chief who knows it better and everyone's interfering and then you're reporting about maybe about uh, companies who are uh, involved in your business, major platform companies, um, whatever. So there's all these interests involved. You can't really keep a distance because you're part of it, which makes it much harder to do really good reporting and independent reporting because you're part of the whole deal. So it's, it's, that's really hard. Um, my second point is uh, that I find when I'm sort of touring conferences, whatever, also in non-media settings, general audiences are increasingly interested in the media. The whole trust debate, you know, is, is, is really cooking. But uh, as we also find uh, confirmed through our research, they don't know much about it. And when I was a man managing editor at Süddeutsche Zeitung, that's Germany's biggest quality newspaper, I gave lots of tours through the newsroom and I always found that visitors were extremely interested in actually, oh, how do you, you know, put this thing together? How does it work? And yeah, do, do you plan everything in advance or do you come up with everything from scratch? So there's really a huge gap in media literacy. and. Um, as our digital news report shows that we publish once a year in, in June, um, last year we, we included questions on media literacy and we found interesting results. Measuring media literacy is not easy, so we asked just some basic questions. For example, this one, which of the following news outlets does not primarily depend on advertising for financial support? And, well, you know, um, Every second person got it right, you know, uh, public broadcast, but this is every second person. And uh, you just need to know the Digital News Report is the biggest ongoing um, study on online news consumption worldwide with uh, 37 countries covered and, and 74,000 uh, respondents. So that's a pretty big study. Every second one of the respondents said public broadcasters, the other ones, well, you know, they, they didn't really know. Many of them didn't really know. Um, question two, measuring news literacy. Which of the following is typically responsible for writing a press release? Yeah, who's responsible? Well, 31% got it right, spokesperson for an organization. But actually 26, that's not actually that much difference. Uh, 26 felt like, oh, a reporter for a news organization is uh, writing a press release. And you can see these other answers. So actually, people don't really know that much what the mechanisms are. When you're so deeply immersed in the media, you feel everybody must know what I'm doing, but actually people don't. And uh, question number three, how are most of the individual decisions about what news stories to show people on Facebook are made? Um, also selected markets. Well, you can see 29%, so not even one third knows the correct answer, that uh, it's algorithms. So everybody is on Facebook, or almost everybody, or in other social media platforms, but not even a third knows you know, how the newsfeed is shaped, what shapes the newsfeed and selects the stories. And um, yeah, this is what, what we measured. Uh, where is, who, who's most likely to have the highest news literacy? What kind of uh, news consumption patterns do they have? Um, well, you, you see that, that actually yeah, many, many of them, the ones with the highest news literacy, uh, read newspapers, newspaper websites. Um, very no news literacy is linked to just uh, television and broadcaster websites. So um, that's really, sort of shocking to many journalists. You know, do people really know so little about the media industry? Um, and my third point, and that's really the core of what I want to tell you today is, is strengthening news literacy is central for the survival of the industry. Well, isn't this too much like, you know, a journalist is speaking here, or is it too a little bit grand, survival of the industry, my God, you know? But we have this debate, um, we have this trust debate, and these figures are also from the Digital News Report. And actually, um, people don't know much about the media, about the media and no wonder really um, that trust in media is fairly, mm, it's so-so, you know? 
44% trust in news overall, which, you know, you can say the glass is half full or the glass is half empty, but actually that means that 56%, uh, the other side, uh, they don't necessarily trust in news. And what's even more surprising is that, that only every second person trusts in the news they, they use themselves. So why don't they trust? Uh, that would be an entirely different debate, but still, you know, there's some gap of knowledge might contribute to this. And um, here you have even lower trust uh, figures for trust uh, in news that come from search or trust in news from social media. Um, so trust is really, yeah, average at the most. And but what we found, and that's why I link this to the survival of the industry, is the higher news literacy is, the more willing readers, audience, uh, other audiences, viewers, are, the more willing they are to pay for news. And this is actually important. So that means that if you incre increase news literacy, so if you report about the media, if you, you know, show people how things work, then they are much more likely to pay for it. And isn't that something that we all want? We aspire to have independent journalism that's not, you know, dependent on, on external funding or funding by whatever, but we want, you know, many readers like our stuff so much that they are willing to pay for it. So that's directly linked to news literacy. Yeah, and uh, this is my conclusion. Uh, investing in news literacy really pays off. It also pays off in real money because the higher news literacy is, the more people are willing to pay for it. Uh, learning about the media actually learning means learning about digitalization as such, about the mechanisms that are behind it, about the power of platforms, about how algorithms shape our choices, our information. So actually teaching people about how the media works really helps them to understand the whole universe of digitalization. So that's another very important point, I think, because yeah, knowledge about digitalization, digitalization literacy is really important these days to, to survive in this information space. And that's why I think let's, or why I say, let's report on the media and put that extra effort into this. Thank you. Or do I have to do something? Should be oh, good, do. great. Yeah, I feel like, Jonathan, that um, talking about ourselves is no longer a luxury. It's now an obligation. Uh, what we're seeing around the world with all the attacks on journalism, which Courtney can talk about, um, means that we now just have to galvanize um, and we have to talk about ourselves as much as possible. And I've spent a huge amount of my career just talking about how great journalism is and what journalists do and um, trying to sort of inculcate my students as well because they're the next generation. And um, I think that it's essential for people to understand what journalism is. And of course, now it's become a question of human, um, human rights and expertise. And I think there's um, a few ways of doing that. One of the things um, that I do is I edited a couple books on investigative journalism in the global south. So bringing together reporting by journalists in Africa and Latin America and Asia over the last 200 years. And I use those books as an excuse to get into countries where the environment is closing and talk about how important journalism is. So I'll go in you know, Kenya, Tanzania, China, anywhere the journalists are under attack, Malaysia a couple years ago, and use the stories of the journalists to galvanize people and understand the contribution they're making. And I think the Jamal Khashoggi was an exact example of that, you know, a terrible human story that really made people start to think about, about journalism, right? It's like the old song, you don't know what you've got till you've gone. Um, the other thing is all the sort of branding efforts, and I actually brought as a little present magnets and buttons. Um, the New York Times now, all kinds of people are making sort of products about journalists. And I think the fact that people keep giving them to me for Christmas and birthday presents shows that their world is starting to understand now that there is this thing called journalist. And it may seem a little self-indulgent to make ourselves seem like heroes, but I, you know, I think it's important to do that in this day and age right now. And then I guess my final point is part of the work that many people at this festival are working on 
is writing about media capture. Um, Marius Dragomir has been doing these incredible sort of mapping and networks, talking about ownership. And in a way, it seems like facing the sort of ugly side of journalism, the fact that it's often sort of corporate owned or owned by people with agendas is an ugly thing to do. But I also think if we do that and if we can speak frankly about that, that will lead to better policy making. So I think we need to sort of talk about how great we are um, and build up, hopefully build some trust, but also be, you know, be honest when there's sort of structural impediments that, that we need to work on. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Courtney Raj. I'm the Advocacy Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists. And hopefully, since many of you are journalists, you've heard of CPJ. Um, but in addition to the emergencies response that we provide in terms of life-saving advice and emergency assistance to journalists, as well as advocating on behalf of those who are killed and imprisoned for their work, the basis for everything that we do is our reporting. So we're kind of like a news service reporting on attacks on the press. So our the very centrality of what we do is reporting on the media. And I think that we do that because we can't possibly understand the level of threats and violence against the media unless we're reporting about it. So the fact that we know that the past three years have seen more than 250 journalists imprisoned around the world is because we have literally reported on each and every one of those journalists who is in prison during our census. The reason that we know statistics such as the fact that nine out of 10 murderers of journalists go free is because we systematically report on the killing of journalists, the murder of journalists, and whether or not there is any meaningful investigation into those murders. If we weren't reporting on that, we wouldn't even know the scope of the problem. So I think there, is, there are a variety of ways of thinking about the news re media reporting on itself. But you know, one of the things that we're really focused on is making sure that we're reporting on journalists who are working it around the world and are not the um, international journalists who might be getting the coverage and the attention of the global media. Tomorrow, Friday, yes, we're launching a campaign called Where is Azori? Has anyone heard of Azori Gwanda? Good, one person. Tomorrow, you're all going to know, well, right now, you're going to know who he is. <laughs> he is a Tanzanian journalist or was, we don't know, he's missing in Tanzania. We don't know if he's alive or if he is dead. Last year, we did a similar campaign for Joan Zabiri, a journalist in Nigeria who was also missing. And when we started reporting on it and demanding, reporting on the situation of when he went missing, what was he reporting on, and asking questions, we ended up forcing the government to reveal that he was in detention and we helped get him out of jail. Unfortunately, I think a couple of days ago, he was rearrested. Nonetheless, we didn't even know that he was alive until we started reporting on it. And so there are hundreds of journalists around the world who are reporting on their communities, on their local governments, their local politicians, on corruption, on human rights, and they don't have the benefit of that global attention. And what we have found at the Committee to Protect Journalists is that the attention that we can bring to those cases offers a form of protection. Right now, for example, we, we spent the past five years advocating for the release of a dear friend and, and journalist, Ali Abd al Fattah, in Egypt, as well as Mahmoud Abu Zayed Shao Khan. Just, I'm getting to that. So, Mahmoud Abu Zayed Khan. Abu Zayed, who's Shao Khan, um, both of whom were journalists covering protests who were imprisoned on charges of terrorism because they were covering protests and covering issues related to the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And we didn't get them out of jail early. We were unsuccessful in that, but we tried our damnedest. I went to Egypt and met with the Minister of Justice and we tried, but nonetheless, we kept their, you know, we kept them in the public eye. We raised their cases with the United Nations, with governments, trying to get any sort of pressure. Now, technically, they have been released, but they have to report to prison, sorry, to jail, to their local jails, every single night for five years. That does not equal freedom. 
So, you know, it's not just about the journalists who are in prison or who are, who are killed. It is also looking at the situation that continues to, um, th that these journalists continue to report in. And it's incredibly dangerous. And Anya mentioned Hashokshi. And Jamal Hashokshi, I really think, um, especially in the United States, where I think people take for granted, you know, this idea that you can work safely, um, put this issue on the agenda in a way that other cases, even the murder of four Capital Gazette journalists and um, a, a media worker there had not, the dangers that journalists face, and the fact that the long arm of these repressive states can reach even into democratic countries, even into um, protected diplomatic compounds. And it's these local journalists uh, and the threats caused by those states, but also by non-state actors. The murder of James Foley and Stephen Sotloff garnered global attention. And part of what we tried to do was to harness that global attention, A, to bring about changes and improvements in how international outlets um, hire freelancers working in conflict zones, but also to highlight the fact that hundreds of local journalists in Iraq and Syria have been murdered and killed in crossfire and on dangerous assignments um, covering their local issues. And if, just to conclude, I think that we have seen a global recognition that journalists can't leave the issue of defending press freedom to others to fight for. And so we have seen a real uptick in the attention that media are giving to the cases of journalists under threat. So we've seen this, for example, with the Washington Post, which started a press freedom partnership. So we are going to put an ad in the Washington Post about Azori, asking where is he, because we need to raise that awareness. We've also seen the launch of the One Free Press Coalition last month um, that came out of uh, an, an elite dinner in Davos, but nonetheless, the editors of all these major news organizations, Forbes, Reuters, AP, many um, global journalism outlets who have decided that every month they're going to devote space to listing the 10 most urgent cases of press freedom around the world, of journalists who are under threat. And so CPJ and the International Women's Media Foundation are working to put that to list together every month so that those media outlets, which together reach more than a billion people, can highlight those cases. Because I think when we talk about trust in the news, a lot of people think that journalists are just sitting behind their computers, you know, typing out stories from press releases, and they don't really realize the grave risk, the grave dangers that they're taking, even when they're a columnist working from the comfort of their home in Washington, D.C. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot more that we can do, and it's, it's really heartening to see that news organizations are realizing that the threats against journalists and the fight for press freedom is a news issue. Great. Um, thank you. Um, about three weeks ago, Google had a big conference in California about local news. They wanted to, it was a global conference about people from around the world to talk about how to support and increase uh, the in independent content from uh, local media outlets. The problem is that not a single person from Africa or from the MENA region attended that conference or was invited. Not a single media outlet was invited, not a single person talked about the situation of media in Africa and the MENA region. I think this speaks volumes about where we are, even though in Africa and the MENA region we consume <laughs> Google and Facebook and everything else and make these guys rich. Uh, nevertheless, they um, don't consider our part of the world important. Um, and partially, I have to admit, they're correct. Partially because uh, a lot of our media is controlled by governments. A lot of media that's controlled by private sector who are in bed with government. So the fact is that uh, when you look at media in a kind of a isolated way, you don't see a lot of independent media in our parts of the world. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It does exist, but it's struggling. It's really, really, really struggling. If there is one area or one group that needs to be supported, 
and to be kind of exposed the work that we are doing and others are doing. It's the independent media, individual groups that are fighting, that are using digital uh, uh, net networks, that are using the Allahs and the others that are uh, bypassing government controls. In the year 2000, I created Amman Net, a radio station on the internet, which was the very first Arab station on the internet because radio was not allowed. You couldn't get a license for a radio station, so I had to use the internet and maybe 10 people were listening to us initially, but we sta stayed on. And then we found a station in the West Bank to kind of take our uh, internet uh, feed and we broadcast it back into Jordan. So we were kind of doing something illegal, but in a legal way. And that went on until 2005 when we got a license to have our own FM station. But even that came with you know, regulation. We have to pay $40,000 a year just to keep our license alive. And it's huge. I mean, I have to spend most of my time fundraising just to keep the license uh, working and the, and the radio station working. Um, we, we have uh, done a lot. I mean, people have done a lot in the MENA region, investigative journalism. We, uh, our organization uh, was involved in the Panama Papers that uh, some of you have heard about. We investigated uh, members of Jordanian's 17th parliament uh, who were um, who had contracts from the government, which is not it's against the law if you're a member of parliament to get contracts, and we exposed them with the help of the Panama Papers. In the next election that happened right after that, seven of those that we highlighted did not get reelected. So there are actual results that you can actually see when people actually uh, work on that. But one of the problems we have is that you often have countries, um, uh, the Jordan as a kind of an example, where you have two different kind of narratives. You have the narratives presented by the government. We, you know, we were the first country to, s to pass an access to information law, first country to join the open government partnership. But in reality, the law has no teeth. The law is not really uh, providing real access. It just looks good on paper and it looks good in international forums. But when it comes to the actual uh, work, you have a totally different system that works where uh, there is a, what we call an unwritten law where governments put pressure on media, especially independent media, to toe the government line. And, and we have to fight that. And, and it's very, very important that we uh, stay, stay uh, alive, stay available, and um, technology has provided us great opportunities. Uh, we are really blessed with having the ability to, uh, to use the internet, to use uh, different uh, even social media to propagate our independent information. The problem is the business model, <laughs> which you know everybody's talked about a few years ago and now big papers like the Washington Post and New York Times have been able to kind of make, uh, you know, turn around and are making money. But most of the small media, even in around the world, and certainly in our part of the world, are not able to kind of make that uh, turn around. And, and they have to depend on, on foundations and on support of different groups. And that always puts you a, in a difficulty. So we are, I think independent media has uh, opportunities to work. I think uh, we did um, a few years ago a, a program called Eye on the Media, where we actually uh, reviewed had journalists actually do uh, writing about the media, which I think is very important. And why we thought that was important, because governments always complain when somebody publishes a story that is wrong, and they say, oh, here are the journalists are all you know, publishing wrong stories. So what we wanted is our own journalists to hold each other accountable to a code of ethics. So instead of having the governments use it or, or use pressure against the media on claims that they are not publishing true stories. We wanted to have fellow journalists kind of hold each other accountable. And I think we need to do a lot more of that. And certainly on the issue of news literacy, which you talked about, it's a huge problem. In, in Jordan, we have like, it's a country of seven million people, four million accounts for Facebook exist. So people are all wired. They all use the social media. And there's a lot of uh, untrue stories on social media, and we need to do a lot more work on, <coughs> on uh, media literacy and getting especially young people involved and active in knowing about that. Stop here. Um, I will uh, open it up for questions, but I'd like to pose one myself first and have each of you um, address it. And all of you have talked about the need for news liter literacy, more reporting on 
journalism and on the nuts and bolts of it. And, you know, uh, maybe start with you, Alexandra, as a former managing editor. Um, what does this, let's talk Turkey. What does this look like? Uh, you know, we, Project Syndicate, have a series that you've, each of you have written for called Press Release, which is, uh, uh, you know, funded by the European Journalism Center. It's a very valuable series for us. Um, uh, and, and the que but the question is, should more people be doing that kind of thing? What should the editorial content, the products, look like uh, that, that, uh, that are engaging, that are informative, that are enlightening, and that kind of move us higher than we are now uh, in, in, in the public's estimation? The editorial content look like that really depends on the audiences you are aiming at, and there are different needs of, of different audiences. So I mean, you, uh, obviously you need to to start with yeah young audiences, and you need to be there where they are. You know whether that's on whatever Instagram, Snapchat. They're actually wonderful formats for for Instagram that are very informative and where you can really uh, even start you know with the, with the young ones. Um, then again, I mean, yeah, writing this kind of commentary that, that we've all been writing is, is really relevant because it has, you know, pretty, pretty good spread throughout the world for the, more, the quality press, wherever. Uh, so you need to have different formats for, for different audiences. There's not just one single product. You just have to make clear what media is and what it does for society, and that's a pillar of democracy, and that democracy really can't function without media, and you have to get that message across no matter which age group. And, and, and you, you said we have to do a lot of work, particularly for, with the young people. Actually, our findings suggest that uh, the older people are, the more likely they are to spread misinformation and stuff. So actually, the young people are actually pretty good at this. And we have to keep working on the young ones, but we also have to address all kinds of age groups with all kinds of different formats. Right, OK. I think part of your confusion points to the fact that there isn't really a universal agreement on what is media literacy, how do you teach it, how do you build trust. Um, I've just finished a 10,000 word literature review on research on media trust since the 1930s and um, it's clear that it's you know very inconsistent um, and very hard to sort of pin down. But what is happening is that because of all the the declines in trust. Everybody's throwing money at the problem right now, and there are efforts all over the world trying to build media trust, trying to focus on, on media literacy, and it can be anything from stuff like this, going out into the community and talking to journalists about what you do, supporting festivals, going into classrooms and explaining like how news is created, inviting audiences into, into um, the newsrooms. So there's a whole range of things that are being done right now. Not much evidence as to whether it'll work. Um, personally, I think that when you talked about self-referential, I think it's important for journalists to understand that this really isn't our fault. We all think, you know, journalists always think the solution to every problem is more journalism, but I think that when you have sort of growing, you know, growing inequality and um, huge sort of unemployment and anxiety about unemployment around the world, you get sort of demagogues and a decline of trust. And it's really not our fault as much as we'd like to think we can fix it all. The last thing I'll say about these efforts, I think they're laudable and I do think they're part of shaping norms, but um, they're very hard to scale. So... So, so that, you know, that is one sort of critique or one problem about them. I could go on, but I'll stop here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So one thing I think it's important to remember is that news literacy is not only an issue for the survival of journalism, it is an issue for the survival of democracy and the ability to participate effectively as a citizen. And I think we really need to remember that. Journalists are not just doing journalism for their, themselves, they are providing a public service. And so I've worked as a journalist in the United States and in, um, in Europe and in the Middle East. And one of the things that struck me about the Middle East is um, li living in Lebanon, where it's very um, partisan press along sectarian lines, people understand when they read a particular news outlet that it is representing a particular point of view. In Egypt, um, where I did my doctoral research looking at cyber activism, citizen journalism is an answer to the state-dominated press. 
Similarly, there are some independent outlets there, and people in Egypt, many of them understood that there were, you know, al-Ahram is the official, um, you know, viewpoint of the state, and that they would get news from different sources. Um, in France, the uh, news media industry is organized, and, and journalists don't try to hide that they have a particular political perspective. And again, you know, a large part of the population knows that. They know if you're reading La Libération versus Le Monde, you're going to get a different type of perspective. In the United States, there is this effort to think of objectivity, that there's this idea that journalists don't have any point of view. When I worked at the New York Times, uh, a lot of journalists that I worked with took pride in the fact that they didn't vote which I don't understand because journalists are also <laughs> citizens. Um, and I think that there is an increasing recognition that actually trying to hide whatever your personal views are could be more problematic than trying to make those more apparent because the fact is you can do your profession well and you can do journalism well even if you personally have a, a personal point of view. There's a way of doing journalism and so we should, I think, be more transparent about that. And thinking about what editorial product should look like, I think we need to do more within journalism, within the individual stories to explain how that journalism is done. We did a survey, um, well, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press commissioned a survey that we were part of um, and, and one of the findings was that people thought that anonymous sources mean that sources are anonymous to the journalist. Mm. Like, no, we were shocked by that. So I think doing more to, to explain to the average reader what it mean, what does an anonymous source mean? To explain more, why did this person not want to go on the record? Why was this official granted anonymity even though they're saying something very basic that does not need to be anonymous? And within the text, or within the you know broadcast to incorporate that into it, like we went out to X number of cities, or we talked to this many types you know people, and then of course using hyperlinks within uh, you know internet-based reporting to offer additional explanation, I could think could be really helpful. Um, thinking about how we help people understand sources is really important because when you look at some of the surveys um, about where people get their news and what they trust. They'll say, oh, I get my news from Facebook. That's like saying, I get my news from the telephone. Like, mm -hmm. it literally tells you nothing, right? <laughs> so we need to think about the sources and, and going beyond that and, and how that can help establish valid validity and credibility. Um, and knowing a journalist, I think, is really challenging. And in the United States, we've seen a real decimation of the local press. We did the first ever press freedom mission to the United States with an international group of press freedom organizations. And we heard on the ground how the um, local journalist numbers are, are really declining. So whereas you might have had somebody covering the school um, you know, school beat and then the courts beat and then the you know, local government beat, now they're trying to cover all of that. So, and they're centralizing a lot of the editing functions. So people might you know, grow up and never even know a journalist, never have met a journalist. And so I think we need to help educate people more about not all journalism is sexy, right? Some journalism is just like basic facts about what did your local government do? What is the situation for, you know, trash collection in your neighborhood? It's an issue around the world from Egypt to the U.S., you know? Um, so I think trying to get out there more as journalists. Um, I was just on a panel recently with uh, somebody from the L.A. Times, and they said that they will set up little booths um, around town say, you know, meet a journalist or ask a question for a journalist and they'll just meet people along the street. And I think that holds, you know, a lot of pro promise. Again, very hard to scale. But in the United States, there is no civics education anymore. And so we really have to look at this systematically. Um, and just, you know, one last thing to conclude, I think that one um, thing that we have done recently with a coalition of more than 20 groups in the United States is to start the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker so that we can systematically document um, attacks and threats against the journalists in the United States because I think there was not real good documentation of that because it's hard to say, oh, we're going to cover, you know, this relatively minor threat or assault against a journalist in the U.S. compared to when you have a journalist being murdered in, you know, any of a dozen countries around the world. So we wanted to be able to focus on that and that helps give us the quantitative and qualitative data that we need in order to talk about that more, um, you know, in a more fact-based way. 
Um, when you talked about Egypt and, and, and Iraq and Lebanon, I was worried that you wouldn't talk about the effects of Facebook because right now, the print media, I mean, young people in, in our region are the majority of the population, and most of them have not touched a physical print paper. They don't, they, I mean, they don't have that feel. They don't pick up a newspaper from a newsstand, and they do say, I saw this on Facebook or I saw this on Twitter. So uh, we need to kind of find a way to get them to look at the source, to find the source, to understand the source, and, and that's, that's really hard. We did a, a training for our high school students and uh, just to give them basic skills and let them to you to kind of become student journalists, and it was such an amazing uh, experience because they, I mean, they learned so much in like two weeks that they would not have learned otherwise, and it actually gave them that power. Once they had the microphone, they could actually interview their own school principal and ask questions they would never ask otherwise. So uh, I, I really do, I know I understand what Annie said about scale, but it's so important when you do this that you could do a lot with that. And I think we can, I think we need to do a lot more um, uh, media literacy through media. I think we are also kind of guilty of not using our own media outlets to uh, educate people. I'm not sure how it could be done, whether it's spots or PSAs or whatever, but we need to do a lot more uh, usage of our uh, airspace, our uh, space online to, to actually educate people. Uh, thank you all very, very much. I'd like to um, see if there are any questions. Uh, we have 13 minutes left. I saw a hand here. I think you're first and, and, and then you. So, uh, oh. Um, good evening and thank you everyone. Uh, I'm very glad that somebody mentioned the dark side of journalism because I think that this dark side is harming journalism as much as authoritarian governments and everything. So I wanted to hear your opinion around uh, the necessity of pushing forward ethical guidelines for journalists and perhaps also promoting self-regulatory uh, bodies in which journalism can actually reflect on itself and act. Yeah, if I can just follow up, because you know, we, we, the whole, every, I think everybody on this, on this panel has assumed that we know what a journalist is. And that is something that's been called into question by you know, the rise of citizen journalism, right? And, and, uh, and blogging and Twitter and, and, and all of the rest of it. So it's a very good question, right? What, what makes journalism a profession rather than an avocation or something that, that people do and they're good at and, but, you know, we can't really pin down why. I mean, we trust them, but, you know. So, so let's, let's, let's try to, uh, uh, you know, address that. What makes journalism you know, a, a, a profession, and, and, and I think the ethical uh, side of that obviously uh, plays a significant role. Alexandra. Actually, that, that varies from country to country, too, yeah. because in some countries you really need to have a certificate or something, or an official accreditation, yeah. whereas in other countries uh, you, everybody can call themselves a journalist. But actually, ethical guidelines, as you say, uh, they exist, and I hope they exist with, with everyone. I mean, there, there are, you know, certain things and, and uh, uh, th that you have to adhere to, and, and they are discussed in every good newsroom. There are big discussions on, on all kinds of ethical questions. You know, can we show this picture or can't we show it? Because, you know, uh, my, my newspaper back then, we didn't show pictures of, of dead people, but could we still show like, you know, a dead migrant child on a, on a beach or something like that? And actually back then we were the only ones who decided, no, we're not going to show it. You can discuss these things forever. So there are guidelines and your question, Jonathan, uh, I think um, uh, journalism is something where you need some sort of self regulation so if I can just I just write a text I publish it am I a journalist no I wouldn't think so you need at least someone else who sort of there must be some oversight you know some sort of checking and uh, in, in newsrooms you have this at least four I principle that someone else reads the text edits the text so just an expression of opinion is, is an expression of opinion but it's not no journalism so there need to be mechanisms and there need to be some sort of procedure and um, 
I'm in, in the Council of, of Europe a Committee on Quality Journalism, and we've been discussing this forever. What is quality journalism? And my argument is always, it's not a single piece of content. It's not a well-written story, but it's a piece of journalism that's, that's uh, yeah, that, that is a process, a process to sort of, you know, uh, yeah, have an approximation of the truth or a process to, to come to, to clear facts and, and it's not just an expression of opinion. So freedom of opinion and journalism are two things that are related, but it's not the same. Can I just respond really quick? Is that okay? So I couldn't disagree more. I think, um, which should make this interesting. Um, I couldn't disagree more because I think that it's important to look at what is journalism as a practice it could be professional or it could be citizen. And I've given this a lot of thought and I have, if anyone's interested, a whole chapter about citizen journalism versus journalism in my book. But basically journalism is about doing a set of practices. It's around facticity, around reporting. You do not have to be a professional to do that. In Egypt, some of the best journalists who were reporting on human rights abuses, on police violence, um, were citizen journalists. They didn't have credentials. They didn't go to school for journalism. In fact, in Egypt, journalism was a very low respected profession and almost none of the bloggers I talked to um, during my time there were allowed to study journalism because their families would only allow them to study medical medicine, engineering, um, you know, or a couple of other professions. And so they wanted to do that on the side. They did very important work. And I think that you can see that through the awards that many of the citizen journalists got. Um, for doing that. So I think absolutely you do not need to be accredited. You do not necessarily need to have an editor. It is about the practice of journalism. And journalism is a specific t form of communication. It is fact-based. It is based on reporting. But to also say that commentary does not count as journalism would discount the ideal idea that Jamal Khashoggi was a journalist. He was a journalist. He was a, 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 an opinion journalist who was reporting and commentating. Um, so I think it's very dangerous to get into the idea that journalists have to go to school and get a degree in journalism. I remember being in Uganda um, where the Minister of Communications was trying to make this argument. They were trying to pass this law where you would have to go to journalism school. You would have to have a credential to be a journalist. Um, I never went to journalism school, but I worked at many journalistic outlets. So I think that you can, anyone can do journalism. It doesn't mean that anybody who's blogging or tweeting or opining is a journalist. There are certain types of people who are journalists. And so I think we should be very careful about that. You know, I've also written for many organizations that don't actually like edit. You know, they'll say, hey, can you write something for us? Submit the article and no editing. Project Syndicate does great job editing. I love writing for them because it improves my writing. But to have an editor, a good editor, is, is such a privilege yeah. as a journalist. Sure. So I don't think we can look at that as um, a requirement. Uh, when I started Amanet, the last people I wanted to hire were journalists. I did not want a single journalist because they all practice self-censorship in our part of the world. To be a journalist in Jordan, you have to be a member of a syndicate. And it's a closed syndicate for basically government media, so I didn't want any journalist. I went to the universities and I wanted somebody who was curious and you know, we could train them, but they, they didn't have to be journalists in the, in the official legal sense. They just had to have the curiosity and the ability to communicate and then we could, you know, they do need training and we did train them, but they didn't have to be uh, accredited or members of the union. Uh, you had a question here, yeah? Wait, wait, wait for the microphone and yeah. Um, I really appreciate that the panel mentioned that it's also the responsibility of the international community to protect the local journalists. And uh, what you describe is actually quite amazing that, for example, the project that you're doing would push all the, for example, the missing journalists on all the international outlet and get attention. But uh, something tricky is that, for example, some countries that all this international media outlet where you exactly should be targeting the audiences are all blocked and all the social medias are blocked and the, the work the local journalists done are never went to all these uh, international uh, media outlet. So do you think in this situation, and it's actually quite a big number, and in this situation do you think still something can be done to protect these local journalists if, for example, the international pressure doesn't really work? 
And uh, it, it follow up is also, I think, a lot of times when we're talking about protecting the journalists, it's always when they're already in prison, when they're already in a really crisis situation, and making them a case, I think it's a great, but sometimes in other areas, I can be in danger in a way, because people think, okay, it's such a dangerous occupation, and not so many organizations are focusing on protecting the journalists that still work there, and make sure they can still continue working that way. Um, do you think something can be done in sort of the earlier stage of protecting the, the journalists? But before we address that question, because we only have about five minutes left, I'm wondering if there's you know, one more person with a question, and then we can try to combine them. Uh, and, and have and have people answer the questions together. Yeah, you. Yeah, on on covering uh, media, covering media. Basically, my question goes towards uh, a lot of times, me bad journalism is part of the problem and sort of creating a conducive environment to to violence and sort of insecurity for journalists. So, how do you cover bad journalistic works among the media community? Okay, so protecting local journalists and covering bad journalists. Who wants to go? <laughs> I can take the question about protecting um, local journalists. So a couple of things. One, um, we have both a proactive and a reactive approach. So our proactive approach is emblem emblematic through our emergencies response team. And that is attempting to get out in front of problems when you see that they're emerging. So for example, we sent a security advisor on the ground to Mosul, um, to Nicaragua, to Venezuela, when we saw that the tensions there were ratcheting up so that we could make sure to provide safety advice and guidance to journalists on the ground, as well as the um, international journalists who would be traveling there. And I think that we can see that, for example, with what's happening in Venezuela. We just sent our emergencies director down to the border there. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of the protection, there are a lot of groups who are working proactively. Article 19 works on leg the legislative environment, right? So decriminalizing defamation campaigns. We've seen a trend in Southern Africa, for example, that will protect journalists because it means they won't be imprisoned for defamation. Same with decriminalizing false news and, things, and blasphemy and things like this that catch journalists. So I think there is proactive work being done, um, but you know, a lot of the cases, for example, let's take Vietnam, very difficult to do proactive work there. It really is about finding third party pressure um, and a lot of it is reactive uh, to there. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a challenge, but there definitely are proactive efforts underway by many organizations. Bad journalism, I think uh, it's self-correcting. I mean, we talked about self-regulation and I think if you have uh, a, a very, I mean, engaging public usually that they, they call them out they, they are usually good at calling out not all the time we've had you know I mean you know a lot of examples of bad journalism all over the world and uh, it's basically the the public the public is sometimes uh, interested in, in I mean they they have their own ideas and they don't want to know the truth uh, I don't know how you can resolve that because uh, in the end uh, they're the consumers so it's, it's not easy, it's not easy to answer that, but I think there is some uh, level of self-correction, but it's not, uh, it's not a, a panacea, it doesn't solve all the problems. There isn't, uh, yeah, we had that case in, in Germany with that reporter of Der Spiegel who came up, who invented characters really, and that was a clear case of covering bad journalism, and what was important to this, I think, and I think there's a panel on this even uh, here in Perugia, uh, what was important is that this, didn't, th this wasn't boiled down to one person doing something wrong, but when you cover bad journalism, you have to find out about the structures that are behind bad journalism. For example, you know, was he encouraged? Was there a particular way of storytelling that was encouraging this kind of making up protagonists? Or bad journalism was also clickbait. You know, are there certain business models that encourage clickbait? So it's really, really important to, to report on bad journalism, also for the whole industry, to reflect on their own bad practices and, and to get to, to good practices, really. 
And can I ask, just mention the ACOS Alliance, the A Culture of Safety Alliance, which started after the murders of James Foley and Stephen Sotloff in Syria, which basically created a, a set of freelance safety principles that both freelancers mm -hmm. and news organizations that hire freelancers, especially in conflict zones, agree to abide by. Very important for proactive safety. I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. There's already a line of people outside uh, desperate to get in. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists. It was a very interesting discussion. Very good questions.